Bless us now, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tonight's teachings deal with those believers, in quotes, who are afraid. I want you to let that sink in. Um, it is about those who claim to believe on Christ but depending on their setting, depending on where they are, they claim to believe on him, but they won't admit it. Now, to some of us, it is unconscionable that someone would claim to believe on Jesus and not admit that they believe on Jesus. But I hold that um, we're seeing an ever-increasing number of believers who claim to believe on Jesus but who will not speak up. Amen. Who claim to believe the Bible and who adhere to the biblical standard in their personal lives and privately and who will actually call and say to people like me and many of you warriors, I'm with you. I stand with you. I'm praying with you but refuse to state it publicly. On a, on a negative, on, in, in, a, in, in a reversal way, I heard uh, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson say in an interview, and I'm not quoting him verbatim, but he says, uh, I have, there are many, many, I have many nighttime friends in the ministry who agree with what I'm preaching that the doctrine of universalism. He says, now they won't admit it, but I have many. And, and, uh, and, and, and the truth is, one of the things that, that happened is when, when he came out with that uh, uh, doctrine, the response of the saints caused many, and many of them are preachers that you love today, and uh, uh, you probably have all of their books and tapes and all that. Many of them, they were all... Uh, he was the forerunner. They were all going along with him, but because of the backlash of the church, they retreated. He didn't step out without counsel and without agreement on his own. But the church, the way the church labeled him a heretic and his teachings are, uh, they are the teachings of a, a heresist. Amen. Amen. The devil is not going to be saved. To be saved, you do have to accept Jesus. Amen. All human beings are not going to ultimately be saved in the end. Everybody's not going to ultimately go to heaven as his, his belief is that everybody's going to be saved. The serial killer, the homosexual, the lesbian, the adulterer, um, the communist, the socialist, the Muslim, the agnostic, the atheist, that in the end, everybody's going to be saved which if, if you really followed his uh, teachings to his logical conclusion, then it, it, it puts him out of business because if that's the case, what's the point of, of the church? I mean, what's the point of preaching? What's, what's the point of all of this if everybody's going to ultimately be saved? I mean, you just think about it. It's lunacy. But he wasn't the only one who felt that way. But when they saw what happened to him, God said, I'm going to keep my Rolls Royces and my mansions, and my popularity, and my money, and my power, and I'll pull back, and we'll wait till we find, think it's a better time to launch. Well, on the side of those of us who believe the Bible, you see the same thing. There are many people who will call in the dark of night or send a private text or get in touch with you uh, in a manner where it's just you and them and will say, I'm with you. I agree with you. I had a preacher one time to come to my office and sit down. A pastor in this city, 
I would, a, a pastor of a wonderful church. And he said to me one time, he says, wouldn't the things that you are preaching, the things that you are standing for, every one of us agrees with you. And he said to me, but we can't say it. We will lose our churches. We will get in trouble. This, it can, this will happen and that will happen. And I'm sitting there looking at him thinking, you're the problem. You're the problem. So am I to feel uh, comforted? <laughs> Should I feel better about it? Amen. Is, is, that, is, that, is that a word of encouragement? When you're standing for Christ and there are people who are standing with you, but they won't stand when it matters, is it supposed to comfort you that they come to you? Uh, let's, let's, let's change the metaphor. Let's ch let me give you a diff different example. You're in a fight. And you're struggling. You can't hardly win. You're fighting somebody that's bigger than you, that's stronger than you, and, and, and your buddy's standing there. You're fighting. They're getting the best of you. And when the fight is over, uh, then your buddy walk up to you and says, you know, I, I started to jump in. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I could have helped you out. If you laying there, one eye hanging out, the other. My God. Man. Now, now you want to fight them. One of my uh, one of my maxims uh, that I, I coined this, uh, and, and I and I say this often: what matters is what you say when it matters. Amen. That's all. That's the only thing that matters. It's, it's what you say when it matters. If to stand up and testify here in a Christian church and say to everybody that I, that you're saved and love the Lord and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit is a wonderful thing. But, but if you go in a place where there aren't any Christians and there's a hostile area and you say nothing, then what you've said to us, you're basically preaching to the converted. You're preaching to the choir. You don't extend the kingdom by preaching to the converted. It really matters when you have the courage to say it in a company of unbelievers. And you don't preface what you say by saying, now I don't mean to offend anybody. And I don't mean any harm. And I don't mean, you know, because we can give a whole bunch of disclaimers. We can disclaim it to the point to, to, that by the time we say it, it doesn't mean anything. Are you with me? I was talking to a bishop friend of mine the other day uh, from uh, Dallas, Texas, Bishop Corby Bush, who is a man of God and a dear friend. And he said to me, he says, Bishop, I praise the Lord for your stand. Um, and brother, more power to you. And he says, I want you to know on my radio broadcast and in, in my church, we, we stand boldly with you. I, I, I proclaimed on the air with the people uh, that, that the, the stand with the scriptures, you know, concerning, you know, the, the, the latest about the little boy and the, the, uh, the, the, the homosexuals and the stand that we made, that, which, is a, which is nothing new, if you know anything about this church. It's, it's, it's been, this has been up a room for 32 years. And it shall continue to be. It ain't going to ever change. And uh, never, never uh, lose sight of the fact that none of the stuff would have been public had the young man not made it public. Because when, when uh, Elder Rayford talked with him, he talked to him in private, in his office. They made the video. They posted these things. And so... Uh, that's how it, it got out and our response to it. And one thing led to another. But my, my friend said to me, he said, one of the things, he says, I have a, one of the problems I have, um, the problem that I have is that there are people who claim to agree with you, but they won't speak up. There are other bishops, other prophets and prophetesses and people in positions of authority who have a platform who will say on the phone or uh, in private, I'm with you, but will not speak up. Uh, and the major reason many won't speak up is that it will cause persecution to come their way. Amen. Amen. We, we know when we stand for life that there are people watching who are out to get us who just, they're just chomping at the bit because our opponents, they, uh, Planned Parenthood and those people, these are some wicked folk. 
There is witchcraft in the, in the uh, abortion movement. They, 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 they try to put spells on us. They try to hex us. They try to throw enchantments. We get cussed out. All kinds of things happen. These people aren't playing. And you can tell by the venom that you can read out there in social media that there are people, there are so-called Christians who no longer uh, promote the biblical standard, but many of them now are promoting a standard that they made up. And it starts with, well, I don't, well, what I think, I don't believe it, I think this, I think that. Well, what about the Bible says? What about the Bible says? The Bible, we get our standard from the Word of God. Amen. And, and I'm not saying this because uh, we're crying out for help, but I want to show you something, show you where we are in society today. And he says, man, I've used my platform to agree, but to agree publicly. Amen. And he says something that I wrote down that I thought was profound. He said, I don't think that any believer who makes a stand should ever have to feel like he or she are standing alone. Isn't that powerful? Another colleague of mine and friend Bishop Bill Wright from out of Memphis, Tennessee, when he saw what was going on, he said he stood in his pulpit and when he preaches, he's taped for his telecast, he's taped for his radio broadcast and he proclaimed publicly a powerful stand and agreement with the standards of God. Because if you read the Bible, you have to wonder on what grounds can you disagree? Amen. By the way, I called both men and, uh, and got permission to, to use their quotes and, and their name. And both men said, by all means. What is the point? The point is that we can't be secret believers. We can't be secret believers and be real believers at the same time. Some people arrive, uh, um, some people develop and, and they get strong before others. But uh, at, at a certain point, you have to grow. The point is that too many believers put self-interest, material gain, popularity uh, ahead of Christ, especially people in ministry, especially people in ministry. If I, if I say something, it may close this door. I don't want to make this group mad. I don't want to offend this person. Let me tell you, I'm going to show you in a few minutes where Jesus uh, said that who you should be concerned about offending is the Lord. Is the Lord. Because nobody can manage your career like God can. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I've been told if all of my ministerial career, you're not going to get anywhere preaching like that. If where I am is nowhere, I thank God for nowhere. Amen. But I'm going to keep going and standing on God's truth. Because the truth is, you don't preach to get somewhere. You preach to obey God. See, that's part of the problem. Today, ministry has become people's industry. It's become their business. It's, it's become the way they put food on the table. So they see, they see ministry. They, they view it through the prisms of gigs. And I've got to get my gig, and I've, I've, got, to, uh, I've got to make sure I don't offend them because they won't invite me to come. And without an invitation, then what, what can I do? Um, uh, trust the Lord. Amen. Now let's look at this a little bit. Now I, I want to say this. Push back. I'm going to give you a word. I want, I, want, I want to talk to you. Push back is real. There's a price. There's a price to be paid for standing for the Lord. Amen. It's, 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 it's real. Um, when you when you stand for Jesus, the devil really gets mad. Amen? And, and when he gets angry, he huffs and he puffs and, and he, he does what he can. But I'm telling you today, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. One of my favorite passages of scripture is on this subject is Philippians chapter 1. Um, and verse 29, it says, For unto you 
It is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Isn't that a new one? Especially with this new, uh, pre, this new uh, knockoff of Christianity that presents the God of the Bible as a genie who basically just gives you, he just, he just exists to give you what you want. You pray a few words and you stand on your word, if, stand on his word, and if you're living right, if you're living holy, he'll just give you everything you want. He said, if you just call me, whatever you want, one song says, you can have it, whatever it is, whatever it is, just ask him, he'll give you what you want. Well, he'll do that too. But part of living for the Lord, part of living for the Lord, and we were taught this back in the day coming up, part of living for the Lord is also suffering for the Lord. Amen. We who suffer with him will reign with him. Part of knowing Jesus is uh, 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 and, and gladly taking on the suffering that, 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 is, that, that is part and parcel uh, 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 to that uh, relationship that you have with him. You're going to, it's going to cost you to serve the Lord. Christianity that, a Christianity that doesn't cost you anything is no Christianity at all. Now, let me show you something. The Bible says in John's Gospel, chapter 3. I want to talk to you about one of those um, secret uh, believers. Nicodemus. John's Gospel, chapter 3. Nicodemus comes. The Bible says, and there was a man of the Pharisees. Now, if you know anything about the Pharisees, you know he was religious. You know he believed in Je Jehovah. Uh, you know he believed the, the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. You know he believed the Pentateuch, the, the writings of Moses. You know he believed the Old Testament and the prophets. You know he was very religious. You know that uh, he wouldn't touch anything unclean. And uh, 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 he wore, he walked around in his phylacteries and, and the word Pharisee literally means separated ones. So here's this separated, righteous man who was considered to be one of the, the authorities in religion. He was among the people in the community, in Jewish society, that they turned to for answers from the Lord. So Nicodemus represented the spiritual hierarchy of the day. He was one of the so-called fathers in the city. Or one of the generals, you know, all these titles we have. He was one of them. And yet this man, the Bible says, and that was a man of the Pharisees, of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He had authority. He came to Jesus by night and said, he was courteous, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher. Now he got it wrong. <laughs> uh, come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, Nicodemus, until you are born again, you can't even really see who I am. You call me rabbi. I'm more than a rabbi. Thank you for the respect, but I'm more than a rabbi. And you call me a teacher. I'm, I do not claim to be a teacher sent from God. I claim to be God. I claim to be God the Son. I bring the kingdom of God to you. And I say to you, you can't see who I am until you're willing to be born again. And so they have the discourse. Now, I won't spend much time on that, but I want to show you where another area in Scripture where Nicodemus reemerges and he speaks up for Christ, but he suffers pushback. John's Gospel, chapter 7, and verse um, 50. Now, what had happened was the, the, the Pharisees were losing ground big time. 
This is amongst the, in the height of Jesus' ministry. People are getting saved, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered, and good things are happening. The Pharisees had sent some soldiers to try to capture Jesus. <laughs> Verse 45 says, Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have you not brought him? We sent you to go and get Jesus and bring him to us. And these guys standing there all dumbfounded, they said to the chief priests and the Pharisees, the officers answered, never man spake like this man. We couldn't arrest him. We've never heard this kind of preacher. We've never heard anybody speak like this man. And when they said that, Oh, you're talking about Jesus derangement syndrome. The Bible says, then answered them, the Pharisees, they said to the soldiers who had just left Jesus, are you deceived also? Uh, did one sermon fool you too? Are you one of those, dumb, one of those dummies who, who's believing Jesus? I mean, the Pharisees at this point, they're desperate because they've lost their grip. They're no longer viewed as the chief uh, uh, religious leaders because see, Jesus was healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water, preaching the kingdom of God. And Jesus is God in the flesh, on God on earth in the flesh. And what the Pharisees should have done is they should have gotten with God. But they resisted the Lord, and in resisting the Lord, you, you resist the power. So now here they are. Their popularity is dying. Their own officers couldn't arrest the Lord. And so now they're, they're beginning to cannibalize each other. So they're eating up their own officers, saying, are you deceived also? And then verse 48, have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Well, have any... Uh, and then, <laughs> they're talking to you amongst themselves. Now, have any of, are any of you believers? <laughs> have any of you been, conver been converted? <laughs> oh, my. But this people, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. They said these, these Galileans, these simple people who are following Jesus, they're silly. They don't know any better. I know none of us have. Nicodemus said unto them, John says parenthetically, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, that is being a Pharisee and a ruler. So Nicodemus being an aristocrat, a Pharisee, a religious leader, one of them, he speaks up. And what he does is he tries to stand for the Lord, but to kind of throw in, instead of making a religious argument and, and, a, and a strong argument for being associated with Jesus, he tries to raise a legal slash religious technicality. He tries to make an um, uh, 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 argument from the law. He says, doth our law judge any man before it hears him? He said, you guys have sent them out to get Jesus. See, so he's trying to reason. He's trying to uh, be a legal technician. See, instead of coming out saying, yes, I'm saved. Yeah, I know Jesus. I'm one of them. I stand with Jesus. Uh, do, do we judge anybody before we get to hear their case? He says, before we hear any man, before we hear him. Do you see that? And know what he doeth. Says, uh, what, he, what he doeth. Says, we haven't even judged him yet. He hasn't even pleaded his case yet. So are we, are we, are we judge, jury, and executioner? And they, the Pharisees, answered and said unto him. <laughs> oh, they, they, they insulted him. Art thou also, they asked him, art thou also of Galilee? Now, what, what is this? Galileans were considered to be crude, were considered to be ignorant, and they were considered to be the stupid people, the little people who were following Jesus. 
So they insult the pushback. They insult Nicodemus by saying, you're stupid too. Are you a Galilean? What do you mean asking this question? See, even though, even though he was, uh, he was you know, kind of scared to, to, to make a real stand, they saw what he was doing. See, let me tell you something out there, uh, uh, preachers and teachers, those who are watching this, the world is not going to allow you. If I be a man of God, you'll see it come to pass. The world is not going to allow you to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's the world who are going to demand that you either decide to go to come on over and, 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 and at your church make a stand and, and lift up holiness or you have to get out of this and go do something else because the world is not going to allow you to do both. Nicodemus here trying to be technical. He should have owned Christ. Now I'll show you where he grew uh, in, in a few minutes, but, but when he uh, gave that technical response, they questioned him, said, art, uh, art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. Out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Because, you see, they had claimed that Jesus was a prophet. Verse 40, many of the people, that, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of said of a truth, this is a prophet. And others says, this is the Christ. And some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? See, so the whole issue was the identity of Jesus. And there were Galileans who believed, that Je uh, believed on Jesus. And there were others who tried to claim that Jesus couldn't have been uh, a prophet because he was from Galilee. And they says, no prophet ever came out of Galilee, which they were factually incorrect for one of the most famous prophets to come out of Galilee was the prophet Jonah. See, let me tell you something. Hatred can block your reasoning. Revenge and a desire, self-righteousness and cowardice can affect the way you see things because you got to try to justify your fear. Your fear of taking a stand. You try to justify it by saying, well, God hadn't called me to speak to these things. Or the Lord hadn't anointed me to speak to these things. No, you're afraid. We'll respect you better if you're honest about it. Well, you know, I'm just so tired of the way people look at me when I tell them I'm a member of Upper Room. I think I'll go join the first church of the fridge there where people aren't talking about them. See ya. We'll be here when you get back. We'll be here when you grow. When you mature. We'll be waiting. And when you come back, we'll receive you with open arms. We understand. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. See, see I told you, this, God's calling us to grow. God, God, the Lord is calling us. The Lord has purchased and preserved us for such a time as this. And you cannot be afraid. Another quick example. Let's go to John's gospel chapter 9. Now Jesus heals a man who was born blind. He was congenially blind. Blind from birth. Jesus heals him. Tells the man to go and wash his eyes. The man went and came back with his sight. You're talking about a good day. And a new world being opened up to someone. He just he heals this guy, okay? Are you following me? Now, they didn't even have social media then. But it all breaks out about how did this man get his sight? Because here's what you couldn't deny. They couldn't deny that he was blind. And they also couldn't deny that he could see. He, he threw away his shades. Got rid of the sea and our dog. Threw away the cane. And began to look at things. Hey, that's, the, that's a tree. That's a dog. He's walking and, he, and, he, and there's, a, there's a ditch there. And he goes around the thing. Oh, he can really see. Well, how did you see? He says, um, uh, look, I don't know. I, I've never met him. A, a man named Jesus. A, a man named Jesus 
He spit on the ground, made clay, anointed my eyes, told me to go wash. I went and washed, and I came back with my sight. Now, that's all I know. A man named Jesus. Somebody ought to shout, a man named Jesus. I'm afraid that many hadn't met the man named Jesus. Because when you meet the man named Jesus, you'll stand for the man named Jesus. Praise the Lord. And your faith is authentic. You will stand for the man named Jesus. Oh my. Uh, the Pharisees just wouldn't have it. <laughs> they, they kept asking the man the same question. Verse 15. Then again, the Pharisees, also the Pharisees asked him, how did you receive, how, how did he receive his sight? And he said to them, he put, he put clay on my eyes and washed and now I do see. And therefore some Therefore said, this is verse 16, therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. <laughs> Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath. Now, so he's not of God because he broke, he healed the man on the Sabbath, uh, but he healed him. He healed him. He didn't just pray for him on the Sabbath. He healed him. He's not of God because he, he didn't keep the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner <laughs> do such things? All around the world, everybody's talking about what Jesus did. Oh, my, I can see him texting now. Oh, boy, this thing is something, isn't it? And I praise God for every bit of it. And so, uh, and uh, says, and how can a man, he said he's a sinner. How can, uh, this says, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And look at this. And there was a division among them. And they said unto the, to the blind man again. How many times are you going to ask me the same question? They said again, what sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, here's what I got to say. You open my eyes, he's a prophet. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what he is. He's a prophet. I can see. Hallelujah. And by the way, you Pharisees, you never opened my eyes. You passed me all my life saying poor thing or nothing. And this man opened my, he's a prophet. I can see him now. He's a prophet. Prophet, prophet, prophet. He's a prophet. <laughs> oh, my. But the Jews did not believe concerning him uh, that he had been uh, <laughs> They didn't believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called uh, the parents of him. Isn't it amazing? Things that God does, the things that God will do for you, they listen, there is there is collateral damage. It, in, it, it involves other people. Praise the Lord. The Lord moves on the man of God, and the saints get pulled into it. And I know some of you, I don't want to get pulled in anything. You know, that's my church. That's my pastor. But don't you tell nobody, I don't want to get pulled in. I'm not going to, I ain't, I'm not going to text no support. I ain't tweeting anything. I'm not, mm -mm, I'm trying to avoid honey child. All of a sudden, they said, get the parents. Daddy said, mama, oh, what are we going to do? See, that's the way God is. When, when, when it's the Lord, and if you know the Lord, you get pulled in. You get pulled in. So since you're going to get pulled in anyway, you might as well jump in. Call, at least you cause an explosion. <laughs> Hit first. So he, he said, let's, let's get his parents. And they asked them, saying, is this your son? <laughs> Who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? Is this your boy? 
Now, who you say was born blind? No, you know who I say. The boy was blind. Everybody, everybody know that my son was blind. That's what the young man tried to do to us, try to question whether or not he was straight. Everybody know he was a homosexual. Tough preaching, isn't it? Tough preaching. Said now, said now, here's my son. Says, who you say, who ye say was born blind. How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know not. We know, excuse me, we know that this is our son and that he was blind. Now they, uh, yeah, yes, but we ain't denying our son. This was my son. This, this was our boy, and he was born blind. <laughs> but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age. That's him. He's grown. And speak for himself. We don't know. Praise the Lord. Now, they knew. They knew. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Because I read the Bible. They knew. The Bible tells us, verse 22, these words spake his parents because they Feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, that he should be put out of the synagogue. People will try to stop you. There are already, there are already things in place to try to ostracize you if you make a stand. If you dare say certain things, if you dare stand for certain things, we've already, we've got a machine in place to come after you. We've got people on social media watching to take you and uh, to, to post your quote and to call on all of the people. Yeah. They, the parents were afraid. Now you would think that as good as Jesus had been to their son. You would think that they would have said, Jesus did it. You would think. And as good as the Lord have been to us, and as good as the Lord have been to the ocean and the sea of bishops and pastors and superintendents and prophets and prophetesses and saints of God who fail to speak up, you would think that as good as the Lord has been, that all of us would speak up for Christ when it matters. When you think. If, if you do that kind of a thing. Now, if you don't do that, you don't, you speak up the way you speak up. Well, I'm not on social media. I'm on the radio. I'm not, I'm not on neither one of them. I'm just at work. I'm, wherever your platform is, you would think that people, when, when the fire is hot, would speak up. Unless, unless, unless they're afraid of being put out of the synagogue. Now, now look. As communication from the synagogue was no small deal. If you was excommunicated, you would lose your, it would mean loss of livelihood. Who? Loss of all privileges. Amen. You couldn't participate in the Passover. You couldn't participate in any of the feasts. Amen. And the people would, wouldn't speak to you. And uh, oh, much. Uh, oh, the parents, the parents says, oh, this price is too high. I, I can't, um, mm -mm. We don't know how he got. We don't. Uh -uh. We don't know. We don't know how he got here. Because we're grateful, but we're not that grateful. Oh yeah, we're brave, 
We'll own him. He was our son. We'll go that far. He was born blind. We'll go that far. But to tell you the truth about how he got healed, we can't go that far. Because if we go that, if we go there, we lose this over here. And you know what the Lord does many times? When the thing that you're afraid that you may lose for standing for him, you know what the Lord does sometimes when you stand for him? You know what the Lord does? He lets you lose it. And then you know what he says? He comes to you and he smiles and says to you, Am I worth it? And then he'll look at you and say, what do you think I meant when I said if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. I don't want to fool you. I don't want to make you think that when you stand for the Lord, God will somehow come in and not let you suffer anything. No, 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 no. I just ran to you where there's suffering involved. It happened. And that's what separates the saints from the sinners. The real ones, the, the thoroughbreds from the mules. Praise the Lord. Those who love the Lord are from those who love convenience. I'm running out of time. There's another man I want to show you uh, who, um, he came around, but he wasn't right at first. John chapter 19. I don't know why. I can't wait for the shut-in so I can pray. we can pray all we want to and I can teach as long as I want and I don't have to, I don't have to I'm not restricted by time. Mm. John chapter 19. Did I say 19? All right, John chapter 19, verse 38 Um. And 39 says, after this, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly feared for the Jews. Big. Big bang. A disciple, but secretly Fear. Do you see that? Secretly for fear, excuse me, of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. This man had that fear also. Now it's no word, it's, it's worth noting that Nicodemus and Joseph did eventually step up. Yeah, they did, because as we read on down in verse 38, uh, we says that he, he was quiet, but he, he besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. And he came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus, and looked at who showed up, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Thank God he grew. He went from slipping in the dark to standing with the crucified body of Christ, coming in contact with Christ's dead body, which would disqualify both he and Nicodemus and everybody who participated in the burial of Christ. It disqualified them from the Passover because you couldn't take the Passover if you come in contact with a dead body. But it didn't matter because they, they, they had God's real Passover lamb in their arms. The point is that people mature. They grow. And I'm challenging the body of Christ to grow. Listen, I want to show you something. You can't have it both ways. I want to show you this. Two, two passages. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. This is good teaching. Amen. It's good teaching. Oh, man. Acts 15 and verse 5 says, 
and there arose certain and there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. So they were, these, these were believers saying that it was not, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You can't do that. They tried to be believers on Jesus, but they wanted to also hold to Moses' circumcision and the law of Moses as part, as part of the requirement for salvation when the only requirement for salvation was belief in the cross. They, you can't have it both ways. And that was a big clash in the church because there were believers who were trying to have it both ways. You can't have the Lord and the world. Now, let me show you this. John's Gospel, chapter uh, 5. John's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 44. <clears throat> the Lord asks a powerful question. He says, how can you believe? How can ye believe? You see it? Still hear the pages turn. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? This shows that way too many preachers are crippled today. The desire for human praise and affirmation, the desire for prestige, the desire to be included into this group and that group have crippled a many of preachers. They won't publicly stand and preach God's word because they view the affirmation, the appreciation, and the acclaim from their friends and cohorts and from this group and that group and getting the door open so they can preach here, there, and, and, and to make sure that they're not under the attack of the, uh, of the social media group or under the, the attack of family or friends. They would rather have those people's camaraderie and those people's praise than the honor and the praise of God only. Oh my, Who, whose praise do you want the most? Do you want honor that comes from the Lord or honor that comes from man? See, you, and you know what? You got to decide that. Well, Lord, if I say this, they'll be angry with me, but God says, but I'll be honored. If I say this, Lord, they'll get upset. The Lord says, but if you say it, I'll be honored. If I stand, Lord, they'll come after me. The Lord says, if you don't stand, I will come after you. <laughs> I, want, I want the Lord's honor. Oh, it's quiet in here. Amen. John G. Butler said this. He says, many in every age have refused to confess Christ lest they be kicked out of some prestigious group. They're so-called closeted Christians in Hollywood, closeted Christians in this group, closeted Christians in the NBA, in the NFL, closeted Christians in uh, uh, this prestigious group or that prestigious group. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, uh, closeted Christians. If you're truly a Christian, the Christian can't stay in the closet. Christianity demands that you come out of the closet. Yeah, but if I come out of the closet, I may get fired. I may not get another role. They may kick me off the team. They may, they may say bad things about me. They may. That's the reality of it. See, you have to be good with that. See, you, you, you do people a disservice to say, yeah, but the Lord will bless you to make it some other way. And he will, but... That can't be the problem. You got to be willing to walk away from it. Paul said all the things that made me somebody, he said, I counted them but dumb. 
See, part of, part of following Jesus, you have to be willing to renounce everything in your life that made you feel that you had arrived. And you reemerge as somebody not because of the car you drive, or how many records you sold, or how large your church is, or how much money you have, but you reemerge as somebody because you've given your heart to Jesus Christ. And your new identity is your relationship with him. It's with him. It's, it's not the college I went to. It's not, praise the Lord, the neighborhood I live in. It's not the clothes I wear. It's my relationship with him. It's not the doors I walk in. It's not whether I preach here or there. It's my relationship with Christ. I'm closing. John MacArthur said, they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They that love, that they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God gives further evidence that these rulers pressed no more, they possessed, excuse me, no more than a superficial religion. How can you believe Jesus scantily asks the religious leaders when you receive glory one from another and you do not seek the glory that comes from the one and only God? Listen, saints, more than you want the pastor to be pleased with you, more than you want your husband or your wife to be pleased with you, more than you want the bishop to be pleased, more than you want the presiding bishop to be pleased, more than you want this group, more than you want that group, more than you want to please social media, more than you want to please, you got to want to please the Lord. You got to want to please the Lord. And sometimes pleasing God means you have to interrupt all them. Amen. Tragically, they love their self-exalting religion and their prestigious position in the synagogue and the Sanhedrin so much that they refused Christ. The great Christian reformer Martin Luther said that if we are not fighting where the battle is the hottest, we are traitors to the cause of Christ. The great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort, but where he stands in times of controversy. The church is under attack. Wicked people are trying to redirect the church. Un the ungodly is trying to tell us who qualifies. The ungodly are trying to dictate to the church who should sing before the Lord. People who are not consecrated, people who are not ordained, people who do not, who do not qualify feel that they can tell the church who is, who is living no godly life, walking in all kinds of sin, and yet they feel that they are entitled to stand in God's house and lead people in praise and worship. And if you dare say, be clean, and you have to be holy first, then you are called everything but a child of God by people who are not spiritual, who don't understand, who take pleasure in standing against the church. One of the great tragedies of the modern day Christian church is that the church now preach against the church. You, you guys are like David's oldest brothers. You, you guys and gals are like David's brothers who stood at the battlefield and you couldn't pay them to say a word to Goliath. They stood there and it, had they been water, you couldn't have poured them on Goliath. Goliath insulted them. Goliath insulted their mama. Goliath insulted their God. And they said nothing. 
Then when David came down, and David said, ah, look, what does the man get who go out and kill this uncircumcised Philistine who dared defiles the army of our God? What will we get? Then, they, then his brothers who would not speak up for God told him, they jumped on him. Go back and keep the sheep. You don't qualify. You're just a little kid. You, you, you be quiet. Thank God he didn't listen to those cowards. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy, church folk, to preach against the church. You get the world on your side when you preach against the church. You get the LGBT and all the rest of the alphabet on your side when you stand against the church. But let me tell you something. When you stand on the word of God, you get the God of the Bible on your side. And I'd rather have Jesus. Praise the Lord. I'd, my God, if, if God be for us. Who can be against us? I speak healing in this room right now. I speak the blessings of God. Even now. Even now. Even right here. Right in the midst of making a stand for Jesus. I speak the blessings of the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes, he's called us to holiness. Yes, he's called us to holiness. Thank you, Jesus. Then they try to uh, try to get on you because you point out that somebody had the audacity to let the church buy them a plane ticket. The church paid your hotel room. The church paid the contract. The church paid whatever you ask. And you know you're coming to a Christian church to sing in front of Christian people at a Christian setting. Everything done in the name of the Lord. And you're paid with Christian dollars while fasting to a false God. And you get upset because the church uh, points that out. You shouldn't have done it. You knew you were coming to church. You know that the church is about Jesus Christ. The church is not about Allah. The church is about Jesus Christ. We are Christians. Oh, I wonder do I have any Christians up in here? My God, we are Christians. Then when you stand up and just point out that somebody had the audacity to do that, then people check you for having the audacity to say what the person had the audacity to do. If you have the audacity to walk in God's house, fast into a false God, I've got the audacity to call you out because you ought to know better. Somebody better say something to God. It's time for the saints. Time for the saints to be saints. Amen. I'm not a secret believer. 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 Father, we're not secret believers. Father, we are not secret believers. We believe on you. We speak up for you. We trust you. In the name of Jesus. We use our platforms. And we speak where the battle is hottest. Oh God. We will not be over here fighting a skirmish where the heat of the battle is right here. We will not get locked up in topics and issues that have no eternal merit while the flames are hot right here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And Father, I pray for every saint Every saint who is here and every saint who is streaming, every saint, I know somebody's offended, but we pray, we pray for you too. But for the saints, I pray this. Prayer number one is, Father, give every believer the strength to stand. But Lord, you showed me that that's not enough. 
but also give each believer, here's where the integrity and the character comes in at. Each believer, the wherewithal to withstand the pushback that comes when you stand. See, you have to, once you make a stand, you gotta ask God now to anoint you to deal with what's coming. Because for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But I heard the Lord say, I have prayed for thee. Glory to God. That thy faith fail thee not. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Now give the Lord a victory praise in this place tonight.